Hi everyone, welcome to this open courted hour, a night at the theatre. I am Leila, for those that you don't know me. I'm the programme manager here at the Courtauld, and I want to start by saying the biggest thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies for their generous support of our digital initiatives, especially tonight's open Courtauld event. And theatre used to be a massive part of my life. I was in more shows and dance classes in the week than I knew what to do with. And the pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on our theatres, dance companies and performers. So as theatres begin to open up here in London, this final open court -old event of the season is devoted to shedding a light on the creative industries that much of our collection is indebted to. We are home to a number of artworks that capture the essence of movement, works in particular by Degas and Rodin, where the subject of the dancers either performing or at rest comes up again and again. However, it is easy to forget the artist depicted and focus on the artist depicting. The hidden figures of the theatre, the stories of dancers themselves, can be lost in many conversations around the representation of ballet and art. Behind the canvas of the Degas we use to market tonight's events, the ballerinas signpost the complex and contradictory lives of those who lived and breathed the theatre. So really looking deeper at our collection, challenges the assumption that theatre, in particular ballet, was and is the domain of the affluent white upper classes. Tonight, we are joining forces with people across the disciplines of art, dance and theatre for an immersive event centred around these paintings, drawings and sculptures of dancers in our collection. And we are inviting you for a virtual night at the theatre, a chance to engage with the artistry of the theatre, both movement and history, through revisiting some of our most loved works. Like always, the event is made up of short segments and I invite you all to put any of your questions in the chat or send them to us on social media with the hashtag OpenCourtauldHour to at CourtauldRes. And I will get to as many of these as possible at the end of the session where we'll be having a panel discussion stroke Q&A. I am now delighted to introduce my wonderful colleague, Alexandra Gerstein, who is McQueen's Curator of Sculpture and Decorative Arts here at the Courtauld. She curated Rodan and Dance, The Essence of Movement back in 2016 for the Courtauld. But tonight, Alexandra will talk us through the paintings, drawings and sculptures of dancers in our collection, and maybe even show us a few that aren't as well known as the Degas. Hello again. How are you? I can see you there. Hello. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so if it's okay, I will hand it over to you to get started. Thank you, Leila, and thank you, all of you, for being here while I share my screen. There we go. Looks perfect, thank you. Thank you. So as Leila said, I will give you a very brief introduction, in fact, more of a snapshot of some of the pieces that are in the Courtauld Gallery collection depicting dance, of dance, of the theatre, for the theatre, and for dance, in so far as um, artists have always um, depicted music and dance, and the accoutrements and costumes and sets and, and ambiance. However, in the 19th century and 20th century, the subject itself becomes itself a subject of fascination, of inquiry and of interest. It's very often a vehicle for studying the female nude, the um, body in motion by a male artist, um, but it isn't always that and it's often the um, study of the backgrounds, the, the narratives, the anecdotes, the stories, the behind the scenes. And so of course here I've illustrated with uh, perhaps our most famous painting by Edgar Degas of two dancers on a stage of 1874. But in fact, I wanted to start, oh, I have to do the arrow, with um, drawing, a very beautiful drawing that to my mind looks very modern and, and fits well um, with some of the, the later pieces I'll show you. But it's really just by way of, of um, uh, acknowledgement that drawing has always, drawing uh, dancers and drawing the figure in motion has always uh, been part of artists' um, practice even if at the time of Joshua Reynolds in the 18th century, it wasn't encouraged as something to look for, uh, to do too much of, but um, to, to do as a private sketch. And so here this drawing with, which is obviously very rapidly executed with flowing lines sort of following the, 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 the figure turns, um, 
it shows also the interest that artists have always had in in drapery and and drape and 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 the body as as a body in motion. But now to turn to um, the the core of what I'd like to show you and focus on is the 19th century, and of course uh, the the highlights of our collection, um, such as the the. Um, painting of the, the two ballet dancers focuses on, on Edgar Degas, who was a, a painter primarily, but in fact his, his, his extreme um, acuity of vision took him to do things that sculptors at the time never did, which was to study the a dancer um, as a nude in posing, uh, in poses that are um, exercises sort of for dance and in the studio. And they very much were private sketches and they weren't meant for anything but uh, um, to be seen in the studio, but, and they were cast after his death. And all of this is, is, is very well known insofar as there are many uh, bronzes um, in, in private and in many public collections. The, the image on, on the left, uh, the woman looking at the sole of her foot is something so extreme in a pose it, 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 that the model who, who posed for him, who was a, a dancer, a young dancer called Pauline, we don't know her last name, talked about holding this pose and having to do it over and over and over again. And Dugas captured it in many drawings and in a number of, of sculptures. The other work on the right is very interesting to us for its provenance, which is that um, it belonged to a, um, a collector and dealer, a very uh, uh, renowned dealer called Lillian Browse, who was known in her time as the Duchess of Cork Street. And um, I will go forward one moment. This is her represented by a, a sculptor, um, Evie Emilio Greco. And she was a dancer, she was a ballet dancer. And in her gallery, she represented a lot of works that, that, put, that, that had at their core um, narrative dance. Um, and she acquired works for her personal collection, which she uh, bequeathed to the court of. And so we are, and, and the Degas bronze, I'll go back on the right, is from her, from her collection. So this is a connection of a dancer and uh, and her collection of works that that uh, um, that, that feature dancers. These two works are, are by Jean Louis Forin, who was a contemporary uh, of and long life friend of Degas, who also liked him like him um, spent his 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 life and his career at the Paris Opera. Um, painting and drawing, and, and he was also a printmaker, um, dancers, dancers at the studio, dancers behind the scenes, dancers um, at the rehearsal. But there was another interest, which was a kind of, in a way, sort of a prurient interest in the, in the, in the or a voyeuristic interest in, in the, um, the happening is kind of the behind the scenes. Um, with uh, men at looking at young women. And so here to the to the left, you have dancer in the wings being spied on and, and, and then here three dancers on a stage and two men looking at her, them. And the the whole um, notion of the, the, the artist depicting modern life is really what is engaged in here. Here we have uh, Lillian Browse and her collection features um, some drawings by, um, by uh, Forin and by Degas. And you can see the, this beautiful drawing uh, by Forin of a, of a, of a back view of a, of a dancer where the, 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 where the focus is really on the movement and on the posture and the, perhaps the atmosphere rather than you know, describing the figure. And with, with Degas, um, with the Degas to, to the right, the two seater, seated dancers, it's the it's the weight it's the it's the it's the heaviness it's the posture that's important to Duga. and so these both were in Lillian Browse's collection and here we get to a sculptor who towards the very end of his career in the last sort of 20 years of his career really indulged his love of dance but um it wasn't the same dance that Dugan and Forin and others um, witnessed and, 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 and painted and, and, and sketched. It was really contemporary dance. So it was dance by way of um, the acrobatic scene and the Moulin Rouge and those kinds of places. It was also dance by way of what he saw in what was at the time the quote, exotic dancers who came from the East and danced at, um, at, at expositions, universal exhibitions exposition. So they were the um, Cambodian dancers and um, they were seen 
by Rodin and others as just a completely breath of fresh air, something they knew nothing about. And the acrobatic dancers were, he was interested in because they were you know, the sort of popular background like him and it wasn't representing um, a dance that was of the elite or a dance that was in his words kind of dead like he thought ballet was so um and and Lillian Browse these two uh, sculptures um are were in her collection and she was critical she was a critical figure in bringing bronzes that were cast by the Musée Rodin it's kind of a complex history but they were bronzes that and were cast after models that had never been cast in bronze. So similar to the Degas, but they were not cast by the estate. They were not cast by the family, uh, like the Degas bronzes. They were cast by the Musée Rodin in the 1950s. And so the large figure um, to, the, to the left on the screen is known as the Grand Danseuse, and, she, and, it, and it was acquired by Lillian Browse, as was this other figure here. The, there are two identical figures, and they're doing a kind of can-can. In, in a way. Um, and Lillian Browse actually wanted to buy the full series for her um, for her and her partners for their gallery. I think there were 12 and she wanted to buy them all and she was told by the museum, well, I'm sorry, we can only part with three or four. So she, but they each partner seemed to want one. So that meant that in fact, there would only be one left for sale. And so this is the one that she um, acquired, which was the case. I'm showing you these two um, a photograph and a drawing. Neither of them are in, in the Courtauld's collection, but they're interesting because they show the real people behind these figures of these figures of drawing of, of dancers. Sorry, that um, Rodin was interested in, and his interest was in the body, and it was in the the very material of of, of movement. Um, this quote in less than a minute, this snapshot of movement is caught has nothing to do with a snapshot, the photo. Um, it's to do with the drawing, it's to do with Rodin and how it's to do with how he drew and he drew, you know, many sheets in 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 uh, in sessions where he would have dancers come to him and, and his studio and, and sort of just just stretch and pose and, and perform, sort of per perform their their private moments of um, of, 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 of stretching and, and preparing for dance. So it wasn't so much the dance, but actually the whole um, the body itself and movement. This is as is just to show you what can be done in a gallery that has a collection of dance materials or, 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 or depictions of dance, which is to kind of not reenact in any any specific sense, but to evoke the um, quality of movement that perhaps the artist would have seen by um, staging something in the gallery in relation to and next to works of art. And so this was dancer Nora Keller, who did a, a breathtaking um, work, a very short work of eight minutes, uh, choreographed by Chauvena Jaya Singh um, in response to the exhibition Rodin and Dance. And here she is, and I think the image um, where she's sort of moving is, is, is very telling because this is the kind of thing that Rodin would have seen, and it isn't a finished movement, it's a sort of getting into posture. And you see in the back and the far back, the large uh, cast of the um, uh, movement A dancer, Grand Danseuse. Um, as I said, Rodin was inspired by contemporary dance. He was inspired by what artists were doing at the time and not by technically um, superlative uh, ballet, but by new ballet. So this is um, Václav Nijinsky in the Ballet Russe. And this is a photograph of him in, in the afternoon of a fawn, which was a very scandalous um, piece of choreography and that Rodin saw in a premiere and stood up and, and, and applauded. And both the uh, dancer, and the artist himself were uh, lambasted widely in the in the press for you know for for um, promoting a kind of dance that was seen as really obscene um, and really extravagant. But uh, it's a long story and it's a little bit uh, slightly mysterious. But we know that Nijinsky went and visited Rodin in his studio and uh, spent an afternoon there posing. And this is um, the same story. It's a bronze that was cast much later. Uh, it has never been, it hadn't been cast in bronze. Um, and it was cast from a model that we know was made around 1912 because that's the date of Nijinsky's visit. Um, and it has the power and the strength and the extreme um, compactness that uh, Nijinsky was famed for and that Rodin certainly admired. Nijinsky and the Ballet Russe were 
hugely revolutionary in bringing to dance something that was so free and that hadn't been seen. And the English um, group, the Bloomsbury group, uh, were, were fascinated by this because it, it showed what modern life was. And so here we have, um, it's only sort of tangentially related to Nijinsky because it's a drawing by Duncan Grant, one of the group um, of a tennis player. And it is balletic in, in some ways, or it, you know, it does seem to, to, to show a, a, a gracefulness, which um, has been related to the uh, choreography that Nijinsky did for the Palais Russe uh, called Les Jeux, which um, premiered in London in these years. And Nijinsky, so it, the story goes, did see, did watch Grant and someone else playing tennis one, one evening. And um, this is why I show this. These are more closely, I think, related to the Ballet Russe and to the influence of the Ballet Russe on artists because it shows dancers or figures in wild abandon um, being, and also kind of forming a decorative possibility or informing uh, the artist to, to um, come up with something highly decorative and, and completely unusual and completely um, free, really. And which seems to echo a lot of the Bloomsbury group's own um, ideas and ethos about free living and completely uh, unconventional and unrestrained freedom and with the body as well. Uh, this is simply to illustrate that I mentioned that we, I was going to show you um, works that are of the dance in so, uh, or of theater. This is a um, set design because Duncan Grant did some set designs and even some costume designs for a French um, avant-garde director called Jacques Coupeau. And this was for a production of Twelfth Night. And it's a really fascinating um, design, set design. And we don't think it was ever, in fact, um, executed. This is a, a fun way to end. And it's a very uh, wonderful and, uh, well, less known figure of the Bloomsbury Group. She was called Winifred Gill. And she managed the Bloomsbury Group's uh, atelier of um, radical designs for the home. And here she made um, a, 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 some designs for toys. And the little, the fat, the, there's the dancing master. And then on the right, there's the castanet dancer. And it's, it's a wonderful uh, work on paper that also has this paper, um, thin paper ribbon that um, comes away from the, from the paper uh, to become a three-dimensional object. And this is just by way of showing the inspiration, I think, for these, um, for these, these works and others, the, the, this is the shawl dance. And you hear, see on the right, someone who was very influential for Rodin called uh, Louis Fuller dancing, an American who danced in Paris, but also came, uh, traveled to Europe. And finally, just as a, to sort of whet your appetite to say, well, actually there's a lot more and things that we personally, I don't know very much about, Leslie Hurry, another Lillian Browse acquisition, another Lillian Browse um, uh, part of the bequest. And here is a costume design for um, Swan Lake. And that really is my jog through aspects of the collection that you may not have been entirely familiar with. And there is more, um, there is a lot of music, there's a lot of dance, there's theater, and there are they, and it's often in unexpected places. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful and well done for fitting in such a huge amount of <laughs> images in such a small space of time. It's also really inspiring for me to start plotting out um, performative interventions that we can do in the gallery really soon and I'm sure there'll be loads of questions about this later on we've actually already had a few in the chat so please do keep sending them in but for now we are moving on to our next speaker I am delighted to introduce Vanessa Ewan Vanessa is senior lecturer and course leader in movement at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama Vanessa ensures through her role that every actor she teaches takes away an excitement about an, and keen interest in the language of the body and the potential of movement as a language to express the human condition. She established actor movement as a subject and her hope is that students and colleagues alike might work with actor movement as a part of their practice. Now, Vanessa will use this passion to present on the reciprocal nature, the connectivity between the discipline of art history and movement and interrogate the ways in which works by artists can inspire and teach actors, dancers, art historians and visual artists alike. And as someone who studied theatre and history of art at undergraduate and was actually quite disillusioned by the lack of conversation that these two disciplines had with each other, I am absolutely thrilled that Vanessa agreed to join us this evening. 
So hello again, Vanessa, and thank you for joining us in the Digital Quartal. It's all right. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's yeah. it, it's lovely as well, Sasha, to be reminded of the collaboration that Aisha and myself had with you. And I have wonderful memories of the Rodan project. And I've just got a little note to say to you, I hope that it has legs to go further because I've been working on something in relation to it. Anyway, for everyone, I hope there's something useful in what I'm about to offer. Um, I will be citing elements from my two books, Actor Movement, co-written by Debbie Green, and Laban's Efforts in Action, co-written by Kate Sikofsky. So I'm going to share my screen now so that you can get a really nice picture of those book covers and the rest of my presentation. Um, slideshow. Ta-da, there we are. So, um, yeah, the actor has the potential to translate all things into performance. But in order to do this, they do need detailed and efficient processes of collecting and bringing as much as possible of the world into the rehearsal room. Through their work, the actor must achieve a broad and mature scope of comprehension, quite possibly before reaching that maturity themselves in terms of age or life experience. After all, they will have to play characters whose experience they cannot know. So it's very important they are able to translate from sources other than simply people they are surrounded by. A painting carries both the fleeting emotions of its subjects and epic statements about the human condition. It offers fundamental insights into everyday body language and gestures. The subjects in a painting are frozen, but theirs is a live stillness, a moment of real life that has been captured in time. And the actors should never underestimate the depth of information that they can get from a painting. So I would like to share a key movement assignment that I offer the actors on the three-year acting programme at Royal Central, involving deep research in relation to art. In this process, the, actors, the actor works to physically recreate a classical painting in three dimensions. The exercise entails the observation and reading of a painting to be translated into one moment of embodied stillness, a perfect physical understanding and evocation of that painting as a captured moment in time. The painting is not a creative launch. The actors aim to recreate it as accurately as they can. They don't alter anything or make anything up. If they cannot see something, say the subject's feet are hidden by a table, then the actor reads the rest of the painting to help fill the blanks. Holding the frozen moment of the painting is the focal point of the exercise, but they also then create two to three seconds of moving action before the moment of the painting and two to three seconds after. It is important that these last three seconds or less, uh, 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 any more than three seconds would be action that is invented or imposed. So, and no more than a few seconds either side are needed to reveal a huge amount of information to the actor about the moment of the painting itself. They discover that the artist has tried to capture life itself, that the artist is grappling with the human condition to understand and to translate it into the painting, that they have sat, stood, paced, spent hours and hours to find and capture it. And the aim is for the actor to realize, this artist has done your job for you. They have understood you and perfected an articulation of the human condition, which you can now reclaim for yourself in your own art. Keeping sizable portions of the research live engages the actor's live Im imagination. So it is essential that the actor visits a gallery to choose and to view a painting. When searching for and choosing their painting, the actor notes down the first impressions without reading or becoming influenced by the curator's notes. The point of view is important in this. Observing is more than seeing. And for the actor, it must engage all their senses. Observations are no good if they are just filed away in their brain. They need to be stored in the body 
live and ready for use. Their body is therefore involved in the selection of their painting, how they view the painting from their first impression through into a deep relationship with the work involves their whole being. This is physical. The body is engaged. The painting doesn't move. But like any visitor to a gallery, the actor does move and listens to the physical responses of their body as they engage with the artworks. To help the actor observe in this way, they need some translation tools in order to focus their skills of observation, store their observations for later use, and help them analyze what they are seeing. So the actor commits the following words to memory as an immediate, short, accessible, physical checklist. Breath, weight, time, and space. There is, there is breath in physical action. If I'm about to do something, I breathe in to prepare. Preparatory breath is different to expressive breath. Breath animates everything. If the actor looks carefully with their physical sensing engaged, they can tell whether the painter has captured, created or understood the moment of the painting as the beginning, middle or end of a breath, whether the breath is of thought or of emotion or of human response. And the actor can question, is the breath, for example, light, thin, is the shade, a colour, and so on. So a painting by a master allows the actor to investigate all the factors of movement. Weight, time and space are three of four motion factors as defined by Laban, a prolific choreographer, lifelong educator and a specialist movement researcher. The amount and placement of weight expressed in the body tells us something about the person's connection with the world. The actor can ask where weight sits in the body and how the weight affects the movement if it pulls downwards, sinks, drops or drags, or it if it implodes, rises, drifts away or even dissipates. The actor can focus on the weight as intention or perhaps as responsibility, determination, timidity disinterest, and so on. When looking at the painting using the frame of time, the actor perceives that time exists in something that is essentially timeless. In understanding the actions that occur just before and after the moment of the painting, they can ask themselves what they know of the speed of each of these movements. It is then that they can begin to see time as a quality within the painting. Space is expressed through the placing of bodies in the composition, their eyeline gaze facing, their proximity to objects, and the artist's depiction of the space beyond the bodies. Colour and texture enhance the felt quality of the space. So using this checklist of breath, weight, time and space gives the actor time to look at all these elements separately, to structure their observing so that they begin to understand everything in the painting is, is in the painting. All these fundamental elements of movement can be found through a detailed process of physical observation and translation. Looking at how the artist has directed the viewer's eye through their use of space in the painting gives a key for the actors when translating the painting into three dimensions. In Combing the Hair, Dega's two-dimensional vision translates to three dimensions easily and perfectly, displaying Dega's deep understanding of crafting three-dimensional space in the two-dimensional form of a painting. As the actors hold the stillness of their recreated painting, an audience is invited to walk into the painting and see the artist's work through the bodies of the actors from every angle. The audience can lie on the floor, peer over a character's shoulder, or look at the painting from a character's point of view. The observers in this way discover as they walk through the painting that the artist's 2D vision translates perfectly to 3D. 
Our physical interactions with each other and the world around us are governed by universal laws. We are all, for example, subject to the law of gravity. The laws of movement and spatial relationships are find, found inside each painting. Inside the Degas, for example, we can see how the diagonal line clearly communicates the narrative of the push and pull in the relationship between the women. Next slide. For the actor, focusing on the space the artist has created does not just illuminate how the artist forms a three-dimensional perspective to represent real-life spatial relationships, but also uncovers how the artist is using space to communicate interpersonal dynamics, emotion, the fragility of life, the story of the human condition. The subject in the painting who is sitting is dependent on the chair, not holding their own weight, but is taking up a large amount of space. But they are at the lower end of a very strong dynamic diagonal line with the standing subject at the top of the diagonal centered over their own weight. This offers delicious complexity in terms of relationship and hierarchy. The felt experience is essential here. The actor sitting and discussing it will not reveal what the body can evidence when put inside the painting. The actor inside the experience of moving the painting allows their instinct to reveal the complex hierarchy in the painting. Paintings are there for everyone. A painting hangs in the gallery and the actor can spend as much time as they need or want with it. A painting doesn't change or disappear. It gives them all the time the actors need to learn, to excavate and to explore. It doesn't get up and move away. It can be trusted to be there forever. An actor can continue their relationship with the painting indefinitely. The epic undercurrents of breath, weight, time and space will remain constant, but as the context of the actor changes through their life, they will discover fresh renditions of these in their painting. The learning they gain from embodying one painting in depth can be translated across to their experience of again engaging with other painted works of art. The painting also offers something else, and I want to end on this, an extra that is worth highlighting. It might be easier to understand using a textual equivalent, but when an actor owns a phrase of Shakespeare through speaking or performing it, they also own in this moment something of Shakespeare's astounding verbal intelligence. If the same actor places themselves inside a painting by Degas, they will own something of the painter's body intelligence. The intelligence of great art is there for all to receive. And this is quite the opposite of the exclusivity sometimes apportioned to it. It does not require prior knowledge, academic proficiency, or intellectual ability to access it. It requires only the confidence of the actor to understand that this is something to which they can relate, something they can own for a time and translate into their own art of performance. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. That was amazing. I honestly wish you'd been there when I was doing my undergrad because this is 100% the element that was missing for me. And I think I'd probably be a much better actor if I had you there. Um, so if people could please continue to add their questions to the chat, we'll get to them. I see there's a lot more coming in for Vanessa as well. It is now my pleasure to introduce you all to Natasha Gilmore who's Artistic Director of Barrowland Ballet, and Nandi Bebby, who's the original cast member of Whiteout for Barrowland Ballet as well. And founded in 2007, Barrowland Ballet is now one of Scotland's most exciting and successful contemporary dance companies built around the artistic work of Natasha. And the company produces high quality, accessible dance theatre performances, which tour nationally and internationally. The work's themes are delivered with wit and humour and the insightful observations of human behaviour are rooted in personal stories. And Natasha and Nandi are joining us now for an in conversation which will touch on the production of Whiteout, which was a heartfelt dance piece that gives resonance to the complexities of biracial relationships. They'll also will discuss the assumption of whiteness in the dance industry and generally have a chat about the impact of the pandemic 
on their practice. So thank you both so much for taking the time to speak to me tonight. I am a huge fan of the work of Barrel and Valley from my time living in Glasgow, and it's lovely to have the opportunity to introduce you guys to our visual arts audience that we have at the Courtauld. Um, and I wanted to just kick off um, by asking you to tell us more generally about the ethos of Barrel and Valley and anything I just missed out there. I think um, I'm often interested in, but yeah, personally, personal stories or stories of others you know that they share with me we work together we devise the work together so the people who work with me are very generous in their um, joining me on that journey and we get to explore and understand things together so that we can then present it on stage we also make dance films as well amazing that's great and Nandi what about you do you have anything to say on that yeah I mean I guess I, I sort of really echo that or um or that I think that's what I felt really drawn to in terms of um, uh, this particular project, which was the first, yeah, the first book I did with um, Bell and Ballet, but also the process that it is about, um, yeah, like collective sharing and like what everyone brings in. And I think that's a really exciting, powerful way of working together. Yeah, definitely, that sounds amazing. Um, and I mentioned this in my emails to you guys before, um, but Whiteout was a work that actually really struck a chord with me when I was in Glasgow and I went to see it with a group from Glasgow Women's Library and I was genuinely shocked when I realised it was the first piece of theatre I had ever seen that represented both interracial relationships and mixed race children and I had come from a background where I saw a lot of theatre, a lot of ballet and this was obviously quite shocking and especially studying and working within the arts at that time, it was kind of a watershed moment where I really started to question why things were the way they were within mm -hmm. dance in particular. And I wondered if you could both tell us about how you came to make this particular work and Nandi, how it felt for you being involved in such an important project at that time. I... Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, uh, I mean, it felt, Great. I mean, I had, it was, it's a very, um, it's very close to me, very close to my heart, that, that project and that process and, I, and, um, and a really open space. And I think, I think it's like within the ethos of Barrel and Ballet's work and the way that, you know, I think you think and feel Natasha, but just like it's an open space and it is about kind of being, um, yeah, like transparent and clear and, and open. And I think, that then for me felt like a really open and, and safe and inv investigatory like process, kind of talk about things, talk about um, and be present in my body and with my histories and with, you know, and my physical journeys and like familial journeys too. And like it, it was, uh, felt brilliant and important. And again, a really powerful responses as well. It was um, yeah, amazing. The feedback was really amazing and positive in terms of like, how and what we were exploring. Yeah, as I think as well, I really, really remember the fact there was a Maud Salter exhibition at the same time, which was depicting mixed race identity, Scottish. I think, she, I can't remember if she's, I can't remember. Anyway, I just remember the two of them. And as the group at Glasgow Women's Library, we went to see both within the space of a few days and everyone in our group was just so overwhelmed by how great it was. So yeah, well done that again but yeah Natasha did you want to say anything to yeah that? I mean so Whiteout is informed yeah by my experience because um you know marriage to a black African from Ivory Coast and had children together and as the mother of biracial children I guess it made me have to address certain mm -hmm. things and effectively acknowledge that they hadn't inherited my white privilege and I had to sort of do quite a lot of processing in terms of that and so I guess that's what interested me in making the work and then we brought these, you know, artists together and obviously for the black cast members, they had a real lived knowledge and experience of racism. But it was something that we all needed to try and take on board and understand so that we could effectively explore it. And so we talked a bit about um, other lived experiences that, you know, are basically anytime someone's really judged you for being for, for what you are rather than who you are as a person, as an individual. And so, you know, we looked at things like, you know, homophobia and you know, sexism, you know, there's lots of things that um, 
people can start to understand and we shared and then that really informed us that feeling of you know frustration and anger that comes from basically being treated with you know disrespect or judgments that you know might not be um fair to you if you know what I mean and I thought it was interesting listening tonight as well that it's actually still very common you know for dance artists to do life modeling and the the dance artist who actually went on to um, replace Nandi when we did we, we toured the work to other countries which was also very interesting in terms of the politics because we performed for example in South Africa and China and Japan and of course there's a very different political context for the work there that mm. um, had a different reaction um, but but Valerie um, has made a work recently called Body Data and it explores um, you know like the black female nude and she started to you know look at um, for example um, she did life modeling and noticed that, you know, I suppose start to think about how the black female nude isn't featured as often and people, she felt like people didn't know almost how to draw her or things like that. I mean, you'd have to look it up and have a look. There's an article online and- yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, so because of white hair, I actually did my master's thesis. Well, partly because of white hair and also an array of other things, but on the presence of people of color in the, performative world but how they were represented in art in Paris in 1900 it was very niche but also very interesting and what I came to really realize was the fact that a lot of people still have this really small idea of what a ballet dancer is and who they can be in their head when actually it's an industry that's always been diverse especially when we talk about ballet and dance more openly I could think people think of one type of ballet but I, um, as Alexandra said at start there is many ways in dance that informed each other. And I wondered um, if you saw things like White Out and other performances that Barreline Ballet has done or anything you've been involved with, Nandi, and how this, it does it challenge this normative view of dance and ballet as you know predominantly white or something that's only for uh, people from upper classes? Do you mean um, like particularly White Out, the uh, production? Yeah, oh. yeah, White Out, yeah. Yeah, for sure, I think, I think it's, um... It like it presents and talks about and challenges like many things or is like bringing I guess it um, is bringing forward many things or just like as I was just saying there's a lot like between all of us a lot of like things that we have to look at <laughs> you know or some there's something which is which I think is like because because that was the start of the work it therefore it's in that and I've been, and totally I think so much about like that the word ballet, like in many other places and countries, the word ballet is the word for the dance, you know, but we have a we have a you know particular scripted idea of what ballet means, but it's um it's wider than that, or we can shift that about. So yeah, yeah, definitely challenge that, I think. I think, you know, because one of the themes that we really looked at was this sense of visibility, heightened visibility in one sense. So for example, I, I'm from London. So being in, you know, a mixed, a biracial relationship and, you know, that is a bit more invisible than it is, for example, in Glasgow, or even if we then go on holiday to the Highlands or, so there's a certain aspect that there's a visibility, there's a heightened visibility of, um, but on the other hand, there's an invisibility. So like a representation, like you were talking about, what, you know, television, film, Disney, you know, um, magazines, whatever. There's an also an invisibility in terms of you know presence for um, different racial you know groups or whatever. So in a sense, we really looked at this idea of visibility, invisibility, and also sameness. So like the show starts where they wear like big hoods, turn their back to the audience, so you can't identify male, female, black, white, and just get a sense of this dancing body, this physical presence that. You're, you're taking away a lot of these sort of judgments and you know that identity can give you and in a way performing in a very different way to how we normally perform you don't normally you know turn your eyes yeah. away or perform with your back effectively so we had to really explore a different physicality and then within that we played with this idea of reveal um, and I think yeah there's something interesting in that this what happens when you see the person and yeah just this game of invisibility and visibility yeah I feel like there's a lot when you want to be seen and when you don't want to be seen and like, like you're like being in that that feeling of either be having to be hidden and then having to reveal yourself and also that can be tricky because that has its own kind of thing as well so it was yeah 
Amazing. Well, before we go to the audience questions, I wanted to ask how the past year has been, well, the year and a half now, actually, has been for you both. And if actually you've had time to think about new projects and if you would maybe in the future consider using an artwork from the Courtauld collection for inspiration or anything. <laughs> I um I did actually make a piece of work, um, but I performed it with my own children, and we we made a video installation piece called Family Portrait, which is effectively a portrait of family life, and it's all set within the rural landscapes in Scotland in the Highlands, and um, plays with our in you know interactions with each other and and the landscapes around us to sort of share this portrait of us effectively, and the audience sit in five inside the four screens and the you know, the sound that's quite an immersive experience with the weather conditions and the sound and um, little personal stories. <laughs> um, that was one thing I felt like we could make, but for us, it affected us a lot because we do a lot of international touring normally. And um, it was quite a tricky situation to have to keep um, canceling effectively, you know, the work for our, you know, our dance artists. And, um, but on the other hand, I think I actually did really um, enjoy having time away because we do just work, 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 and it's very intense. You have a lot of, you know, the experience of deadline for premiere and actually having space and time to be with my family was actually, I think in many ways, quite useful. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd, say, I'd say similarly that in terms of kind of the, 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 the forced stop, I guess, can, did give space for or and still is giving space sort of to either yes think or live slightly differently, spend time in different ways, and that can be good for like the creative mind. It has been mad at definitely in, in terms of I think a lot of my work is is uh, live based, so it was a, a long period of like just not happening <laughs> in that way. But um, I found that there was some really lovely kind of interactions online or different ways of thinking creatively that I was able to in, like, interact with. And then the moments of coming together also felt really powerful. I guess I feel more, even more like uh, dedicated to the power of like being together and creating and devising together and making work together <laughs> than, than ever. So. Yeah. We've been working a lot outdoors as well, which has been really different, you know, doing dance classes outdoors. I've been working in a school actually with a film of Whiteout and we've made a short dance film with the children and talking to them about their experiences. Um, it's in a part of Glasgow, Pollock Shield. So, you know, it's a very, there's a lot, most of them are, you know, Pakistani um, family heritage and um, Muslim and they, you know, talking to them about their experiences and making a film with them. So there's been things we can do, but it's been quite frustrating. But also, of course, we would love to be inspired by one of your works of art at some point and <laughs> take other inspirations <laughs> to us and to our, to our, you know, work that we do do in, within the community setting as well. That's great. Thank you. And yeah, and also that sounds fun going out, outside and doing dancing, but maybe not all the time in Scotland when it's <laughs> chucking it down. But yeah, thank you both so much. I find it really useful to like kind of freeze this entire theme of thinking about what we can do now, the contemporary practice, and also situate that in the historic artworks that we have. And it sounds like there's gonna be lots of exciting things for both of you to come up soon. So I'm now gonna invite Vanessa and Alexandra to come back on screen, because I see that there is a few questions for everyone. Um, we probably have, yeah, we have about 10 minutes to ask a few questions. And if people just wanna chip in, some of them are, for particular people, others are not. So the first one that I have is a really great question actually, is so much of the art of theatre is the depiction of women. Does this reflect the absence of male performers or the prevalence of male artists? I think that may be for me. But then yeah, I think that's a good um, one for you. <laughs> I did see that. I mean, I want to tell the person, what do you think? You know, it's sort of, um, th there were, there were male performers, um, but the female, it's sort of too, well, it, it's complex, but the, 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 the female body has always been that which artists have sort of have, have, have lavished most attention on. And it's true that most artists have been men, but it's, yeah, I don't know what, um, I mean, it's interesting with Nijinsky that actually that figure becomes someone who fascinates um, he wasn't classically male at all, and, he, and but you know, or, or conventionally. But it, the and I don't know if that's a first. I don't know. I'm not. Uh, despite that, I've worked in this field. I'm not. You know, I don't know. 
that much about, about artists depicting dancers, but I think that is a, but perhaps those who work in dance can tell me. I mean, the, the Nijinsky figure is someone who kind of strikes, he sort of takes the place, I guess, of the, of the, of the ballerina or the, I don't know if he, I, anyway, it's not really answering the question. I think, yes, because there were a lot of male artists and the female nude and dance and as an extension of, 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 of uh, you know, seeking to understand uh, the body in the female body. And also because, sorry, but we'll get back to Nijinsky. And also because if you look at the art of Impressionists and Duga and Poha and others, they were interested in the kind of unseemly, the, the undersides of the ballet that looked so beautiful and, and you know, buttoned down and all that. And then the underside being these young girls who you know, came from poor families who didn't, and who were often, you know, escorts to, escorted by men or, you know, there was a, there's that whole other side that, and there was a lot of literature about that, which gets quite nasty around the edges that in the 19th century in French um, kind of, um, uh, yeah, French media is about, the whole, uh, the, uh, the around, you know, around the dance. Um, so yes, but about Nijinsky, I'm kind of curious to know what the, those who work in, you know, theater and dance would think about him as a figure of fascination um, because he was unconventional. He was everything kind of, he, yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously he was such a yeah, unique dancer, but it was also to do with the, you know, the sort of in a sense, the, the, the modern ballet, you know, and that he took risks and actually, his sister was also an incredible choreographer and did some really amazing works. Um, that yeah, his as sister well, who was as well, yeah. valued, but she um, yeah, um, yeah. I think he just was a, you know such an intriguing dancer, such a unique dancer, and a risk taker. So it's so doing something radical and you know with that music as well. Yes, you know the string. You know that there was a rad radical. You know it's a very radical period in dance. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, it, it was just that he has a personality in the way that I don't know, were there other female dancers who had that kind of, yeah, original personality, that sort of whole person, you know, the, the whole um, backstory and the everything. Um, I suppose moving later, there would be people like Isidore Duncan or, you know, who've inspired works or people like that. Um, but the Prima Ballerina is, has a particular aesthetic, you know, kind of the ethereal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, someone like a dancer of that period of the, well, before um, Nijinsky and who wasn't a classical dancer at all is Loie Fuller. She didn't have, you know, the mm -hmm. classical, she was an American. She was not, you know, particularly slim and, and lithe like a ballet dancer, she wasn't. And she did fantastically uh, energetic and sort of, right? this kind of, you know, gymnastical things with her arms under these drapes and drapes of, of material. And so, and, and, and moving her, I'm sorry, I'm trying to move my arms, but moving her arms around to make her, the drapery kind of float and, and make shape. So she was a personality, I suppose, and she didn't have, she wasn't classic, but she wasn't admired for her dance technique, but for her technical, the feats. Yeah, I think that's probably the same with a few of the dancers at the Moulin Rouge as well, who are really famed for certain dancing abilities that they had, such as the can-can. <laughs> yeah, probably their individualism could come out much more than when you're actually doing the choreography of a ballet. It's much harder to have your uniqueness coming through, I would imagine. So Yeah, it's a lot of a, a celebrity culture as well when you get into the that kind of dance scene. But does anyone else have anything to say on that point or will I ask the next question? Great. Well, so this is a question actually for Vanessa. So it says, I think the idea of writing a book about movement is very interesting. How difficult was it to convey your points about something so physical and alive into a medium that is static and still on paper? Painting and sculpture seem to bypass this problem, but the medium of text really comes up against it. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> I agree. Um, it was very hard. I, I co-wrote both both of my books because um, I do find words very difficult. I think I think the thing is the language I really honour is the language of movement, and I come from a dance background, and I know that others will understand this. But when you've spent a life in pretty much a lot of silence, you know, you've been in a studio, you've been working, and you and you know, and then. You go, oh, I need to get this. I need to get this out. I need to write this. I need to make sure people read this. And then it's some sort of, I don't know, some sort of madness that says I need to write this down. And then you're stuck doing that thing. And so, yeah, 
it's very hard and i think um both 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 my books have uh videos and audios attached um so yeah i i, I, I can honestly say it's very hard i think talking about abstract art and anything abstract because um language is abstract you know um then there's a match it's sort of i think that's where it's easier when you're talking about something that is inherent and 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 um not really that often talked about which is just movement because everybody moves uh that's where it gets a little tricky because there isn't enough words for that yet so we need some more words yeah i think that's definitely true i wrote a particularly terrible essay when i was at glasgow about trying to basically summarize everything you've said but it was I did not know how to write that I'm embarrassed if that ever comes into the, the world again um, <laughs> I can say oh sorry just I was going to say as a little addendum because I know what Vanessa says is true but she's also being very modest because actually there is a language that you're kind of inventing or that you're sort of crafting I think to um to communicate the at least in the work that I've done with you to communicate the uh, the the inner feeling that you as a practitioner and teacher know that I as an art historian think I understand by looking and having the experience I mean I say I you know an, an art historian or a person who observes visually and you know mm -hmm. and hopefully interpret visual material mm -hmm. observes and thinks we understand because we know how to discuss you know how, what we're looking at and but the embodied experience of movement, which is then depicted by someone watching someone move, is is actually there's so many different removes. It's really interesting, and I found the process. Just to, for those um, listeners and, and and you don't know, Vanessa and her colleague Aisha Tashkiran and I worked together on um, the exhibition catalog of the Rodin exhibition we did in 2016, and we worked on certain sections. It, they their import their uh, uh, contribution was crucial because you know it, without having actually made those poses as a dancer as you Nancy and that you know you don't know what it takes to get into them and it's actually so you do have the words to express that mm -hmm. on the other side and it's it's absolutely fascinating you you ran workshops with students from um the Central School of Speech and Drama and from the well we'd wanted more from the Cortal but you know next time we do it we'll get more and it was there were workshops where the work that you and your colleagues, you and Aisha and other colleagues had prepared was done either before or after visiting the exhibition. So that you had an, well, before for sure, and then um, after you'd see the exhibition and you had an embodied response to it. Because mm, that was great. Good. So mm -hmm. actually there's a lot of language, you know, that you can describe these things. You just have to work really hard at it. And I think, as I'm a huge advocate and I'm all of, of inter, um, interdisciplinary work, I just think the only way to do it is to sort of get various experiences in, because otherwise, you know, um, well, unless you're a sort of polymath, it's unlikely you're going to get that part. Anyway, that was just my sort of uh, champion nice. of your writing and all that. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's fantastic. And I just quickly wanted to ask before we round up, um, just, what it feels like as a performer to work in the gallery space, if you've ever worked in it, like just in itself, like what is that kind of experience? How does it differ from being in, you know, a theater or um, another space that you would work in? Um, like in any gallery space? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, in some ways, I guess if I have performed in gallery space, I'm, I enjoy it. There's a sense of freedom I find from um, because it it's not set up in a com uh, in a conventional theatre setting. I like you can the you know, like the, the front can be everywhere. The space can be everywhere, and you're also like sitting inside all of this other creative knowledge. You're sitting inside all the work, and that can be really freeing. Um, and also just how the pro proximity as well, I think is really, really interesting about being in the gallery space, because you can be right, you're, you can be right up close to the artwork and to the, to the people. And so like everybody sort of can therefore be in, inside of it. 
or I also find it interesting sometimes in in the spaces how the um how we collect ourselves it's just, you know how audiences come into a space to view something and also how we can shift and switch and play around with that too um which i think is what is interesting about being in the gallery space like that but i think the amount of kind of creativity around in a gallery space makes it an interest of particular mm -hmm. place to be moving in i think amazing well thank you so much and you're definitely helping me and Alexandra make a case actually for us to do more dance and performative invention when we go forward when we reopen but yeah thank you all so much that's all we have time for um yeah it's been really lovely open and thought-provoking I think um, and thank you again to Bloomberg for being so supportive of these events and for everyone at home for tuning in Open Court Old is going to come back in September we're having a little break over summer and as we are edging ever closer to the relaunch. I know that everyone will want to keep updated. So do follow the court on social media or join our mailing list. And as we've all just said, all of us on screen are very keen to do more things that involve performative interventions in our gallery. So if you're interested in where this leads, please do stay in touch with us. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you again and see you all soon. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, bye everyone, night. Thank you. Thank you.